Armor of Truth. In the age of technocracy, scientism, and pop atheism, faith is resistance. Nietzsche, of course, announced the death of God. of the Übermensch, the Superman, who would take humanity to new heights and to create a new world order. Find us at the Brad from Carolina YouTube channel. And log on. Armoroftruth.net. Greetings, everybody. Welcome. Here we are. Not a moment too soon. I'm sure you agree. Welcome, folks, to the show. Uh, we're diving right in today. Uh, no pomp and circumstance, no preliminaries. There's a lot to get to, plenty to get to. There's more to get to than I can possibly get to. That's how much there is to get to. There's a lot to cover here. All right, welcome, folks. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here. It's a good group waiting as we get started. Of course, God bless John Wayne. I see you out there. Lovely summer will be in the chat with you. I see Nana P and Ms. O will be out there. Those folks are there to help you out if you have any questions. Anything going on out there? Um, for some reason, Streamlabs is not running the links to the donation links, or they weren't during the last show. Uh, also, the in the in the YouTube, if you know, while, while we're still able to do it, the uh, Super Chats are there if you prefer to do that. There are links in the description if you'd like to help us out. There are links there to help you, help us with donations if you'd like. We are a full-time ministry here. And today we're dealing with apologetics in a, uh, in a unique way with, uh, with, with an argument that... Some of you may not have heard, I don't know, some of you may not have heard this sort of argument. Now, the idea of Jesus mythicists is probably not new to you. You probably were aware. You may even at some point in your life, or maybe even now, you believe that Jesus never existed. Jesus of Nazareth was just made up, was a myth. Well, the argument that we're dealing with today has to do with, let's jump over here. Uh, one of the guys who was around on YouTube back when things were really jumping over here on YouTube and, and you could say things without getting clubbed over the head and put in the corner, uh, as it's happened to us here recently, who knows how long we'll be here. That's, that's why it's very important that you find us at armoroftruth.net and find us on Odyssey. And uh, that's why we're... we're working hard right now with the uh, support that you guys give us to set up an independent platform so we don't have to rely on BitChute or, or Odyssey or any of that. Our own independent platform. We'll be there too. But anyway, uh, yeah, so Adam Green was, uh, was on YouTube back in the day when, uh, when you could still say things and uh, has been removed. I've, he's had his channels taken down on YouTube, and I think that's, I think that's terrible. It's awful. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, but you can find his work over on BitChute and uh, other places. Uh, I think no more news dot org, perhaps, but no more news dot com or dot org. One of those. I want to make sure I give his particulars out there because uh, uh, I'm going to be taking issue with some of his claims today, and I just want to make sure that he gets uh, proper credit for uh, you know the videos that I'm going to show. I'm not going to show much of his video, but, or the, the couple videos that I have that I've seen because I, you know, uh, I, I'm going to be using them in a transformative way to comment over them, but you know, you never know how people might be about using their content, but we'll play a little bit of it because we need to get some context for what's being said here. All right, there is a, a claim coming out of a very sm look the Jesus mythicist group is a fringe group already that's already a fringe in the uh, academic community but now this is Jesus mythicist for a completely different reason 
This is the idea being that Christianity, that Jesus, Christianity itself was created as a deception to enslave Gentiles. That's, that's generally the claim here. And if you're familiar with Adam's work, you'll, you'll see. I mean, you'll, you'll, under, you'll understand uh, that's, uh, that's generally his perspective. He has a, uh, a well-known position uh, toward uh, Israel and uh, the, the Jews historically and in modern times. So uh, we're not here to comment too much on that, as if we could. You couldn't if you wanted to here. Uh, but we're going to deal with specifically, is Jesus a myth? Because to answer the question, is Jesus and Christianity a myth created to enslave the Gentiles? Well, all you have to do is prove that Jesus was real, prove that Jesus lived, prove that Jesus was in the world. Okay, and the rest of it falls down like a house of cards. But we'll go in deeper than that. We want to understand how can you know anything at all about history? Is it even possible to know anything about history? Is everything that we do as Christians just Blind faith. Is there any reason involved in this at all as a Christian? Well, let's see. We'll deal with it. Uh, let's just say hello to everyone right quick. I see uh, Lillian Harned is in the house. Good to see you. Sarah Connor, Christopher Cunningham. Uh, Leslie Mars is with us. Sean Gruner is out there. There's Kelly Henson. Jack Burton is in the house with his nom de plume. Stephen 712 is here. Denise Butler. Stranded 360 is here. Couldn't figure out where the music was coming from. Sorry about that. Big Dave is with us, of course, as usual. God bless John Wayne. And there's Nana P. Looks like the whole crowd is here. 20 Below is with us, of course. And there's Valor and the rest of the gang. Uh, C. Wake Rider Wakey is here. Good to see you. Shelly in South Oz, AFJ3RD. Good to see you, everyone. Let's, um, let's get busy here. All right, to start out with, um, I do have a poll question that I put out earlier today. And it is... Asking the question, I'll put this poll question in the live chat. I'll pin it to the top of the live chat right now. Poll question is this. Was Jesus of Nazareth a real flesh and blood man who lived in first century Palestine? Was Jesus a real person? To make that poll question a little shorter. Let me put this in the chat for you. Okay, there you go. Now, the, it's, the link is in the live chat and also pinned to the top of the live chat. If you're on your phone or your laptop or your device of some kind, you can see that and tap on that. Otherwise, you can just navigate over to the Brad from Carolina YouTube channel and on the community tab at the top of the page, you'll see it there. And you can check, you can find the, the poll question there. Let's look at this poll question. There it is. 107 responses so far. Was Jesus of Nazareth a real flesh and blood man who lived in first century Palestine? Well, out of 100 folks so far, a little over 100, 95% of you say yes. Yes. Earlier, there were some people there who, there, was some, there were a couple people in the no category earlier today. That, they have disappeared. What happened there? And uh, the third response is, it is impossible to know what happened in history. Can't even know for sure. So 5% of you, uh, so about uh, six of you out there so far have said that can't even really know what happens in history. Just a few comments. Blood washed child says when your enemies uh, write about the effects you have on people, it's usually a good sign that you're real. A man going his own way says, if you deny the Lord, he will deny you in front of the Father. And B. Davis simply says, Roman occupied Israel. Okay. So, folks, go over there. We'll check back in on this poll question a little later, and we'll see how this is going. 
uh, we get we have a good idea. You know, the audience here is probably going to answer this in the in the affirmative. But what we're hoping for is to reach out beyond our own audience. We don't want to preach to the choir. We want to get out to those people who need to hear this. We want to reach people who have never heard the arguments uh, for the truth claims of Christianity. We want to, we want people who may have like uh, people who who may be like Adam who who think that being a Christian is just you're just taught blind faith. You're taught not to question. Now you're taught to judge anyone who doesn't think like you. And he'll say that. You'll hear him say that. That's what he, that's what he believes Christianity is. So we would like to reach people who have that distorted opinion of what being a follower of Jesus Christ means. So let's, uh, yeah, a few more votes have come in. It's, uh, 96% yes, Jesus, well, was Jesus of Nazareth, the real flesh and blood man who lived in first century Palestine? Yeah, 114 votes, 96% yes, 4% say you can't even know any, you can't even know what's real in history. That's a bit black-pilled and cynical, don't you think? Listen, I understand, I've been there, I'm not criticizing you for it. Okay, let's, uh, let's see, I've got a couple of these uh, videos of Adam's queued up here, we'll see what's going on. Uh, of course, uh, what we're dealing with is, let's see, this one, I'll play this first because he gives, he, he's given us a good uh, understanding, or he's explaining what he, what he believes Christianity is in this video called, Is Jesus a Myth? Examining the Evidence. And then uh, this other video where he's interviewing a uh, scholar, where, not a New Testament scholar, this is a scholar of a different, of a different ilk, but nonetheless, gentleman who's written a book called The Jesus Hoax, How Paul's Cabal Fooled the World for 2,000 Years. David Skirbina, Ph.D., will be, uh, will be dealing with his claims. Uh, let me just say this. There are no new arguments against Christianity. They've all been heard. There are no new arguments. Someone might create one, but there are no new. Uh, no, none of the, there are no arguments that have not been addressed. All right, so let's, this is just, this is well known. But let's start out here for a second. And uh, the, the reason I say that is because there's just no way. There's like five hours of video here to cover. Uh, and, and there's just no way we can cover it all. So we're going to take the, the, the his general, Scribina's general argument that he lays out and deal with that. And I also want to deal a little bit with what Adam says about Christianity here. Uh, I'm not going to be focused on Adam as much as I am the arguments that are coming from the myth, of the, the mythicist community. Try to say mythicist three times. That's tough. So uh, let's get a. I believe this is the one. I'm here with no more news live. Thank you all for joining me. Today is Thursday, May uh, Thursday, May twentieth, twenty twenty one. Yeah, that's a different one. I wanted to start. Here we go. And uh, right up front, I just want to put this out there. Trigger warning. Flashing red trigger warning because we are going to be examining an extremely uh, taboo, stigmatized, sacred cow to go after. We're going to be examining, is Jesus a myth? I had on philosophy professor and author on a couple weeks ago, David Skirbina, talk about his book, The Jesus Hoax. And it's uh, ignited a firestorm of triggered snowflakes and a bunch of, uh, it kind of started a debate a little bit. And <laughs> were they triggered snowflakes or was it a debate? Which one? And was <laughs> this is, uh, we're talking about one of the most, or the most influential character in all of history, Jesus Christ. And this is not a topic that is very popular with a lot of people in this genre. I'm sure I will get tons of thumbs down, thumbs down for Jesus. People that are are dogmatic, close-minded, that uh, can't even uh, can't even analyze the information without feeling like they are committing a sin. And uh, all right, are you dogmatic and close-minded? Is that is that you? Does that describe you? Is that who you are? Well, let's um, let me give you my opening statement before we get started here so for this report and i don't know folks this might this might have to go on we might have to do uh, a couple of these this is there's just so much here that needs to be addressed and these are the things that we deal with here in addition to you know what's going on 
current events and around the world with obviously the things that we see happening right now, we, that's, it's relevant. It's all relevant. You know, we want to live by a proper scriptural cultural theology. That means that Jesus is Lord of all of your life, not just your prayer life or your life while you're sitting in church or Jesus is Lord of all your life. Uh, that's, that's how we, we want to live out our faith. So for this report, though, we're going to set aside defending Jesus' claims and proof of deity because, you know, we're dealing with folks who are saying this. We're not, they're not ready for that. Uh, here we're going to focus on uh, the objections to the essential formation and purpose of the Christian faith, uh, as it's offered here by Adam Green in his video series. Our purpose here is to set the record straight and overturn, if you'll pardon me, some sloppy research, and some bad reasoning, uh, and some straw manning also. First of all, let's ask a question. Should we, just should anyone, just accept a claim that Jesus is a myth and that the New Testament documents are deceptions simply on the assertion that some Jews, either now or at some other point in history, acted with nefarious or evil intentions? Does, does, does whether or not Jesus existed have anything to do with the character of the Jewish people? Is it possible, this is important, is it possible for one's own personal opinion about a whole group of people, for example, to be so biased that his research and reporting could be myopic, could only see it one way, or that his research and reporting could be severely flawed in, in some ways. Uh, how much of a role does emotion play in an issue like this? Now, the reason we bring this up is because this is no insignificant claim that Adam's making. Uh, it's not just Adam, and he's appealing to a small and very unique strain of Jesus mythicists who claim that Christianity is a Jewish deception created to enslave Gentiles. That's a positive claim. And that means that there would need, you would need to provide evidence to support that claim. So, the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, it sounds like there's a, excuse the truck, <laughs> passing by out there. The historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, the authenticity of the New Testament documents and the validity of the message that's found within are the most important topics in the history of mankind. Adam said it himself. But why? Why is this issue so important? The answer is because your very soul is at stake. Now, that's either true or it's not true. There is no neutrality on that issue. If the Jews made it all up and Jesus is a myth, then all of us, Christian or not, we're all hopelessly lost in a meaningless universe and we're bound for annihilation. There's no point to any of this. But, but, if Jesus can be shown to be a real person who lived in first century Palestine, if the New Testament documents can be shown to be reliable, and thus the Christian faith shown to be true, then this topic has consequences that reverberate throughout eternity. In other words, this is the most important topic known to man. This is everything. And that's why I'm covering it. I don't know Adam Green, or do I have any personal opinions about Adam Green. Someone in the chat earlier on the day when I had the video posted said, Hey, you got... Adam's picture up there because you're interviewing him or you just got it up there for clout? Really? Clout? Clout? Nobody, nobody knows either one of us. So that's clout chasing doesn't really hold here. So I don't know Adam and I, I, don't, really, I don't really have any personal opinion about him. I'm just going to deal with what he's saying. So this is not a hit piece. And it's not clout chasing, of course. Nobody knows either one of us really or very few do. Uh, now, of course, as I said earlier, I support Adam's right to speak his mind freely, and I'd be willing to defend that right, even to the death. But this report is about the claims that are made by Adam and 
at least one other Jesus mythicist and author, David Scabina. Now, I see Adam as a reporter. I just see him as a reporter. I see him as a reporter with a severe bias, for one thing. So I'm going to deal lightly with, with Adam's claims. However, Dr. Uh, Dr. Scabina, Ph.D., is making claims from the chair as uh, authoritative claims as a scholar, although out of his field, still, nonetheless, making academic claims. So I'll be speaking more directly to his claims. Now, a word about method. How do we go about this? I'm not just going to sit here and, and appeal to Christian sources. Uh, you'll see in a moment. I'm going to I'm going to defer heavily to uh, non-Christian sources, as well as atheist scholars who have written extensively on the topic of whether or not Jesus actually lived and whether or not the history reported by the writers of the New Testament is relevant and authentic. Why? Because these days, you had better know what you believe and be able to explain why you believe it. Know what you believe. Know why you believe it. Or There are many people out there ready and willing to pull you into their belief system. And that's why we want to talk about Christianity and reason. We'll be doing that in just a bit after we deal, first of all, with Christianity as an allegory. That's one of the main claims here, that Christianity is just an allegory. But let's listen, first of all. He's going to mention, uh, it may be in this video, but if not, let me, let me go ahead and say, he's going to be mentioning uh, three authors. Uh, we mentioned Scribina already. The other two are David Fitzgerald in a book called Nailed, which he's going to talk about right here, or he's going to introduce. And also, a book called The Jesus Puzzle, written by Earl Doherty. I'm going to deal specifically with the claims in that book also. Once again, let me tell you, just say it once again, there are no new claims. All right, so uh, against the historicity and authenticity of Jesus and the Christian faith. There's, there's nothing new out there. It's all been dealt with. So let's listen to a couple more minutes of uh, Adam's intro here. Uh, I've been reading many books on this, and it's there's a very strong case to be made that Christianity and Jesus started as a mythological, allegorical concept, a book that I highly suggest. And, and I don't even want to hear anybody talking trash. If you haven't read this book, Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Showed Jesus Never Existed at All, I've read this, listened to it on Audible several times, as well as part two, which is Jesus Mything in Action by David Fitzgerald, the, the part two of Nailed. Really, if, if you refuse to look at this information and uh, you just want to keep repeating and uh, willfully ignorant and believing this mis misinformation about the reliability of the Gospels and Paul's letters and all of the, uh, the l total lack of evidence outside of the Bible, it, not to mention the Old Testament is fake. The Old Testament is magic. The Jews were never chosen. They don't have a special covenant. The Lord doesn't speak and choose them and give them the land. And of course, if the Old Testament is fake and delusional that the Jews believe, then that would make Christianity also not real. Okay, so the claims, first of all here, is it's just an allegory. All right, it's just an allegory. Jesus never existed. If you can just show that Jesus existed, that was a historical figure, then nothing else they say matters. Nothing else after that matters because that is... That is what the entire argument hinges on, is that it's just a myth. Jesus never existed. All right? So we don't have to go any further than that. Our work here is easy. Okay. So let's, uh, let's, let's leave it right there for a minute. We'll, uh, I'll introduce you to the, uh, Dr. Skirbina in just a bit. But we've, we've got, some, got some claims here so far. Uh, I think he's going to – let me just see. He'll mention the book, uh, the and when Jesus we see Puzzle. How – World Jewry has used Christian Zionism. There would be no, there would be no Zionism without Christianity. They wouldn't have the influence. They probably wouldn't have Israel. All of uh, you know, I, I, I'm not even sure if on this platform I can play Adam's video. That's just crazy over here. But let me just, let me just deal with this. First of all, Christianity as an allegory. That's a claim here. We've got, we've got 
Christianity is an allegory, and of course he'll say here later that you're, you're a Christian, you're just believing what you're told to believe. You know, blind faith. Now, if you'll, in, let's see, let's, let's, first of all, let's deal with the, the book. Then he, he'll, I think he'll bring it up here in just a minute, called The, uh, the Jesus Puzzle by uh, Earl Doherty. And the way I'm going to, uh, I've reviewed Doherty's book myself. It's been around a couple decades. So I want to take a look at the claims he's made in there. The way I'm going to do this, though, is uh, let's, uh, Adam's got his scholars. I will bring my scholars. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use, I'm going to use uh, Mike Lacona, a uh, historian who has written extensively on the historicity of uh, the New Testament, the resurrection. But th so primarily in, uh, in the book, The Jesus Puzzle, one of the books that Adam's going to mention here, the argument is, the question is asked, did Jesus exist? Well, now, we start out inside the New Testament, and those, those who tell you you can't use the Bible, you know, to give evidence for the Bible, well, that's just ridiculous. That's not how history is done at all. The Bible is not a book. It's a collection. It's a collection of books, letters, biographies. But we're just going to, let's just focus on the New Testament here. Apostle Paul, I, we're going to get claims about Paul too. We'll deal with all that. Apostle Paul mentions one or more of the brothers of Jesus as those he knows personally and on a number of occasions shows that he knows of the historical Jesus. Now the claim here is that Paul never knew Jesus. There's no way. In other words, he created a completely new religion. Now, I've got that at the end of my outline today. That might even have to be in a different show. Just take, just take that whole issue and deal with it. But that is one of the main claims here, that, that Paul was working for the deception. He never met Jesus. Well, that's not necessarily true. As a, as a Pharisee living in, living in the area at the time... He would have had many occasions to see Jesus because uh, if, if you're familiar with the story at all, they encountered one another quite a bit, Pharisees and Jesus. But Paul mentions one or more of the brothers of Jesus inside the text. And those he knows personally on a number of occasions shows that he knows of the historical Jesus, knows a good number of the early traditions about him. And there is a fair chance that Paul saw and heard Jesus. Perhaps he even met him. So in order for Earl Doherty's hypothesis to work, he has to present a reasonable and compelling case for why we should ignore all of these references. It's not enough to just say, ah, it's all allegory. How do you determine what is historical? Doherty claims that the majority of scholars... That are, that are used to, you know, that are mentioned to support the historicity of the, of the New Testament. He says that they're almost exclusively drawn from the ranks of the most conservative biblical exegetes far to the right on the critical spectrum, if indeed they lie anywhere upon it at all. But this just avoids the issue. Describing where a scholar sits on the spectrum of, of liberal to conservative has nothing to do with whether or not it's true, whether or not what they offer is true. Of course, Lacona doesn't, uh, he, he's, uh, he says this, Notice the scholars whom I quoted, on Barnett, uh, Borncombe, Brown, Bultmann, Burridge, uh, Burskog, Carrier, Charlesworth, Craig, Dunn, Ehrman, there's, there's, there's uh, atheists in here, Evans, Feldman, France, Funk, Grant, Habermas, Hammer, Hendrickson, Hengel, Hurtado, on down the line, most of whom can hardly be said to belong to the, quote, ranks of the most conservative biblical exegetes, because there's a, there, there are atheist scholars in here. Uh, mentioning what the majority of the contemporary scholars hold on specific issues is not to argue that these scholars are always correct either, but it just shows that nearly all of today's scholarship, all, uh, including the skeptical ones, hold a view that is contrary to many of the claims, like Darty and Scribina make, the claims that Darty specifically, Scribina also, just simply drop on their viewers and readers as a fact. 
They just drop these claims out there as though they're fact. Many times without supporting data or argument. Now, Doherty speaks of some new evidence that's been made available since the 70s that supports his theory, such as the Q hypothesis, the Nag Hammadi Library, and the Jewish Pseudepigrapha. But he's a bit optimistic in this. Does he think that a group like the Jesus Seminar, known for, for having an extremely liberal approach to, uh, to New Testament documents and uh, the life of Jesus himself, does he think that the Jesus Seminar fellows, who have employed these sources extensively in their writings and who are not hesitant to rock the boat, would not be interested in becoming Jesus mythers if you could prove it? Doherty reports that not even the fourth R, which is a periodical published by the West Star Institute, which is where the Jesus Seminar comes from, not even, the, not even this group is interested in, in discussing his hypothesis that Jesus was a myth. The editor for this periodical wrote that the question pertaining to whether Jesus really existed is not a living discussion among scholars. And he also added, quote, If someone wants to doubt the existence of Jesus, my experience is that no evidence or argument will change his mind. This, in spite of a $5,000 offer, as an incentive to open the discussion. Their request was declined. Now, this is quite a blow to the mythicist movement, to Doherty and his colleagues, such as Skirbina and Fitzgerald. It's like a guy who wants to impress his new girlfriend by cooking for her, and he prepares an elaborate dinner that seems delicious to him, but smells and tastes so horrible to his girlfriend that she refuses to take a bite. But in frustration, he puts a little of his food on the floor for the dog who only sniffs it and walks away. It's that bad. No amount of evidence or argument will change the minds of hyper-skeptics like the ones we have here. Doherty, Fleming, Fitzgerald, Skirbina, and, you know, we'll include Adam here because it's, it's, his, it's his video. Uh, Lacona says here his preference is to continue to do scholarly research in areas that are actually living discussions among scholars. And this requires resisting the temptation to be distracted into further discussion with the likes of many of these Jesus mythicists, a discussion that would require a lot of time. It does, like I've noticed I've, as I've been putting this together, yeah, it, I can see why people would not bother with this because it takes a while to put together the responses to this, but they're all there. Lacona says he regards the hypothesis and the view as quackery. This from a historian. Perhaps some mythers will interpret this as backing down from the fight. Perhaps some will interpret this as backing down from what they regard as irrefutable arguments. I'm sure that's probably what we would hear uh, from Adam and his scholars. But let them think what they might. It's okay. The Jesus mythers will continue to advance their thesis and complain of being kept outside the arena of serious academic discussions. They'll carry their signs around that say Jesus never existed. They won't listen to me and label those inside the arena as anti-intellectuals, fundamentalists, Zionists, probably call us Probably because of Zionists, because misguided liberals. Doherty and Fitzgerald, Scribina and the others are baffled that all but a few naive onlookers pass them by quickly, wagging their heads and rolling their eyes. They never see that they do have support. They have fellow picketers out there with signs less than just, just a little ways away from them. One of them might be the president of Iran, for example. He, too, is frustrated and carries a sign that says the same thing. Is that the company you'd like to keep? Now, if you will, indulge me for just a moment here. Uh, I want to step aside from, from, well, it's not completely stepping aside from Green and Skirbina and the 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 arguments that they're making here. I want to uh, 
Here's uh, David Scribina's website. I did include this in the in the description. There's a link to his. If you want to check out his books and his website, and I'm talking about him here. I just want to be fair. You can uh, contact him here if you like or whatever. But if you'll indulge me for a moment here, any chance I get to address further the utter sloppiness of the zeitgeist movie and its contributors specifically acharya s now let's be respectful she has passed away uh, she's no longer with us so uh we're just you know we're we want, so i just want to mention that and be careful i don't want to speak ill of the dead we're talking about her claims her work and not her as a person Michael Cohen has also, interestingly, I found this interesting. I didn't realize that he had addressed these issues. So I thought, hey, let's, uh, let's see what a historian whose specialty happens to be the New Testament uh, has to say about zeitgeist and the claims of Jesus mythicism from that perspective. Lacona answers Acharya S. In a, a, a back and forth. They had a, a, a blog, a couple blogs that went back and forth. This is obviously years ago. He answers her and the claim of Christianity as an allegory by addressing astrology, moon worship, masonry. Does gospel mean God spell? That's part of the zeitgeist claim. And, of course, the atrocities committed in the name of Christ. All of this should surely discredit, discount, and disqualify Christianity as being real, right? Well, there are attempts to show that Judaism is strongly influenced by astrology. Now, this is not the argument that Skirbina and those have, have made, but I can't resist the opportunity here to just, to just once again show how ridiculous Zeitgeist is. So I want to share this from uh, Lacona's conversation with Acharya S., where he contacted Professor Noel Swerdlow of the University of Chicago. This is one of the sources. That Acharya, now, Zeitgeist used D.M. Murdoch, Acharya S., you know, writes under two names, or wrote under two names. They just used her work and research, and a little bit of Jordan Maxwell, for that movie. Now, these are not good sources. And you'll see why this is. One of the sources that she used was Noel Swerd, Professor Noel Swerdlow of the University of Chicago. He is professor of astronomy and astrophysics and has specialized in the study of how those in antiquity through the 17th century viewed the skies. Now, Mike Lacona contacted Mr. Swerdlow, Dr. Swerdlow, and he showed from the book called The Christ Conspiracy. This one by D.M. Murdoch, Acharya S. This is, this, is the this is the book. This is Zeitgeist. This is where Zeitgeist got their information. This is where it came from. Now, here's what, the, here's what the professor said. I read through the passage you sent me, and it is so filled with errors about ancient astronomy and astrology that one barely knows where to begin. She simply repeats a lot of nonsense. Uh, Gerald Massey. Uh, if if, if uh, Acharya S. had one main source that she used, it was Gerald Massey, who was, uh, I think, a poet. He was, a, he was a, an amateur Egyptologist. This was in the uh, late 1800s. An occultist. All right, that's, if, if you've seen Zeitgeist, you understand what you're looking at. You're looking at an indoctrination to occultism. That's what it is. Anyway... Professor Swerdlow says she simply repeats a lot of nonsense that is not taken seriously by any competent historian of ancient astronomy and astrology. And all she can do is quote modern writers, some of them who are very misinformed. This is what is evidence. What she writes is not history, but mere citation of authority. That may be all right in theology, but it can't fly in history. I'll add just a few specific comments about her remarks, and here's one. He says, In truth, no one knows the origin of the Zodiac. Claims to the contrary are nothing more than speculation unsupported by evidence. Now, this goes on for a while. I have included this, this exchange, this document, linked it in the description for you if you want to check this out. Another 
comment he made was, based on this understanding, she claims that Jesus, whom she regards as no more than a myth, recognized the coming of the age of Pisces, and thus the Christian fish of antiquity was created. You heard that one, right? That's another zeitgeist claim. Professor Swerdlow responded with the following. He says, In antiquity, constellations were just groups of stars, and there were no borders separating the region of one from the region of another. In astrology, for computational purposes, the zodiacal, zodiacal signs were taken as 12 arcs of 30 degrees measured from the vernal equinox. The modern ideas about the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius are based upon the location of the vernal equinox in the regions of the stars of those constellations. But the regions, the borders between those constellations are complete are a completely modern convention of the International Astronomical Union for the purpose of mapping and never had any astrological significance. As he, he finishes up and says, I hope this is helpful, although in truth what this woman is claiming is so wacky that it is hardly worth answering. So when this woman says that the Christian fish was a symbol of the coming age of Pisces, she is saying something that no one would have thought to say in antiquity because in which constellation of the fixed stars the vernal equinox was located was of no significance and is entirely an idea of modern, perhaps 20th century astrology. Her own source. She used Swerdlow as one of her sources. And he doesn't even agree with her. Your own source acknowledges that Swerdlow is both well-informed and that his opinion reflects current scholarly opinion based on textual evidence. In other, no, to, be more, to be more clear, one of her main sources used Swerdlow as a source. And so that's where you can find some. Acharya's own source. Okay. Now the claim about moon worship in Judaism. You get this in Zeitgeist, and this comes from the Jesus Mythicist crowd, so it's relevant here too. Was Judaism essentially moon worship? Uh, it's not a matter of allegory being, quote, above the heads of the vested believers, as Acharya S. has asserted, or D.M. Murdoch, whichever it's... It depends on which book you have. The Christ Conspiracy, it's D.M. Murdoch... Uh, the sons of God, Krishna, Buddha, and Christ unveiled. She goes by the nom de plume Acharya S. And there was a time when these books were so popular. I remember, right? 2012, the, the around, right around those years when uh, the New Age movement was, was really, it really had a lot of steam. Right? It's a matter of, it's not a matter of allegory being above the heads of vested believers, this idea of was Judaism based on moon worship. It's a matter of a responsible exegesis of the text of Scripture, one that any interested individual can employ simply by reading the text. Acharya S. cited psychologist Theodore Reich on the matter of moon worship within Judaism. And Reich appeals to Moses Maimonides. This is one of, the, one of those that... Uh, uh, Adam has appealed to in his video, who lived from 1135 to 1204, who cites moon worship as the religion of Adam. Rabbi Michael Penitz disagrees by saying that there, uh, there is no extant literature to support this, and Penitz agrees that volumes of ancient Near Eastern texts have been recovered which speak of a very powerful moon goddess in pagan cultures. Moreover, there certainly seems to have been a syncretistic there seems to have been syncretistic cultures within Judaism. This syncretism just means they pull from many religions to make one. So that does seem to have, uh, to have been uh, an error of cultures within Judaism where a pure Hebrew faith had been tainted by outside pagan influence, which was absorbed into the culture and retained for some time, many years perhaps. However, the absorbing of pagan practices has been done by some of the adherents of all religions to some extent, and it is not indicative that Judaism or any other uh, had, had pagan moon worship as its origin. Now, also, Reich claims that the moon was an emblem of Israel in Talmudic literature and in Hebrew tradition. The mythical ancestors of the Hebrews lived in Ur and Haran, the centers of the Semitic moon cult. 
Acharya then comments that Abraham's father was a star worshiper, as was Abraham himself, until he found the real God. Now, the Talmud is a 2nd century A.D. Uh, oral traditions written down of course, uh, at this point now and beyond. So it's not, it, it, it goes back no, no earlier than the 2nd century and does not support this point for a 1st century or prior corroboration. So she's using the Talmud as a, as a source here. She, so ultimately the point is she has not cited a single Talmudic reference in support of her view. So, Abraham's alleged practice of moon worship before he found the real God, if true, no more indicates that he continued this practice after finding the real God any more than Paul's prior commitment to being a zealous Pharisee indicates that he continued ritual sacrifices after his conversion to Christianity. What we have here is a non sequitur. It does not, does not follow. So that's, once again, I'm... Just highlighting this because we want to get on back to the specifics of uh, Skirbina, Skirbina's argument here. But I couldn't resist. Also, Freemasonry. Uh, regarding Masonry's influence on the origin of Christianity, in support of your view that the Masons were involved in the invention of Christianity, you provide a quotation from Thomas Paine. I'm talking about Acharya S. once again. Christ Conspiracy. She provides a quotation from Thomas Paine, who does not say, at least in your quotation of him, that Christianity had its origin from Masons. He merely claims that both are derived from the worship of the sun, a claim that is certainly wrong. Let's look at, uh, let's see, we'll go, let's look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19. And beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all peoples under the whole heaven. You can go on to Deuteronomy 17, verses... Uh, Two through five, if there is found among you within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, a man or a woman who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshiped them or the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven which I have forbidden, and it is told you, and you hear of it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it is true and certain that such an abomination has been done in Israel, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil thing, and you shall stone that man or woman to death. <laughs> so, there, uh, Job 31, 26 through 28, Ezekiel 8, verses 16 through 17. The point here is, in the presence of these references, the two I read and the others, pain had uh, Thomas Paine had a lot of explaining to do in regards to how the first Christians who were Jews went from sun worship to Jesus when sun worship was forbidden in Judaism. You know, death was the penalty. And then Acharya S. cites Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Mason who claims that religion is based on astrology. It's called astrotheology. Uh, once again, we've, we've dealt with uh, Jordan Maxwell's misappropriation of text many times here, of uh, text of Scripture. So, uh, you know, using Manly P. Hall as one of your sources, someone who already believes, teaches, whether he believes it or not, it's part of his occult tradition to say that all religions are, are astrotheological or based on astrology, yet does this support your view that the Masons were responsible for the origin of Christianity? Does it follow? No, she does not make the case worth any serious consideration. Now, uh, also the term God spell. You know, you'll hear that. Didn't you know the word gospel means God spell? So, Lacona responding to... Uh, Acharya asks here, he says, In your answer to my point concerning the absence of scholarship and your definition of gospel, you say that 
she she she, she charged Mike Lacona of having no sense of humor or imagination. She says, your remark reminds me of Solomon's proverb, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death. So is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, was I not joking? Proverbs 26, 18 says, let the readers of your book read your statement in context and judge for themselves whether you were joking or if you made an academic blooper. That's the claim she made. Right? She claimed that by saying gospel really meant God's belt, she was just joking. So is it true? Was she just joking? Was Zeitgeist just joking when they said it? Well, in reality, the contradictions in the Gospels are overwhelming. This is what she wrote in her book. In reality, the contradictions in the Gospels are overwhelming and irreconcilable uh, in the rational mind. In fact, the Gospel was not designed to be rational, as the true meaning of the word gospel is God's spell. As in magic, hypnosis, and delusion, says Acharya S. in The Christ Conspiracy. She goes on to say, as Max says, one of her sources, uh, the narrative Gospels can no longer be viewed as the trustworthy accounts of unique and stupendous historical events at the foundation of the Christian faith. The Gospels must now be seen as the result of early Christian myth-making. Now, Lacona goes on to say here, Upon further review of your statement in context, it still does not appear to me that your statement regarding the meaning of Gospel is anything but a statement of fact. In other words, she wasn't joking. She got caught in a blooper and didn't admit it. Even in your second defense of this definition, you indicate that you truly are holding on to that meaning of gospel, meaning God's spell, defending that the basic etymology of gospel, as provided by the Concise Oxford Dictionary uh, uh, English Etymology, supports this view. But again, as I stated in my paper, it does not matter what the English word means. What matters is what the word means and the language it was written down in something Murdoch does not even bother to consider. Again, this seems to be a very odd mistake by someone who claims to be a scholar of the Greek language, or for that matter, any language. So, a few things. Now, uh, one last piece here. I appreciate you indulging me on this little side, side road in our presentation today. What about the atrocities committed in the name of Christ? Certainly, certainly this supports Jesus' mythicism, right? How could any honest person with any integrity defend this theology, this ideology, with its bloody past or its supposed founder, Jesus, who, who's on whose omnipotent shoulders ultimately rests the responsibility for the management of the world and thus its endless atrocities, right? How could there be evil in the world? How could there be a God with evil in the world? You cannot judge a philosophy by its abuses. Jesus would not have condoned the Crusades and the numerous inquisitions initiated by the Catholic Church. Jesus, in other words, what, what did Jesus teach? Does it match up? Jesus would not have said to kill people in his name. Indeed, he told Peter to put his sword away and that Christians should love their enemies. It was only later that the Catholic Church, motivated by its political ambitions, used religious rhetoric to sanctify its goals of domination as well as provide an aggressive defense against conquering Islam. You cannot judge a philosophy by its abuse. And what's more, have you forgotten? The evils committed by atheists in the 20th century alone, more than 17 million people were killed as a result of atheistic movements. Joseph Stalin, 7 million. Adolf Hitler, 9 million, or whatever you think. Uh, Khmer Rouge, 1.2 million. By contrast, about half a million people or less were killed as a result of the Crusades between the very end of the 11th and 16th centuries, about 400 years. Although most consider the Crusades to have ended by the beginning of the 14th century. So even if you add those tortured and killed by numerous inquisitions conducted by the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic system, it's not even close to the tens of millions you claim. Now, of course, we did not have the weapons of mass destruction in the Middle Ages that we have today, so the comparison only goes so far. 
Uh, it's easier to kill more people today. That's the point. A more accurate comparison might be with regards to consciously religious states such as Iran, Iraq, and Israel versus nationalistic states such as Germany, Russia, and Cambodia. Even considering the Islamic states of Iran and Iraq, uh, as well as uh, the deaths caused by Islamic terrorists in the 20th century, including the recent attacks, this is written closer to 9-11, these hardly compare with the deaths caused by nationalism during the same period. Even though a great many national causes dress themselves up in religious jargon, just as they have used terms like freedom, for example, Vietnam, and Lenin, did those atrocities committed by atheists invalidate atheism? I think not, because you cannot judge a philosophy by its abuse. Thank you for indulging me. As we, anytime we have an opportunity to dive into shredding zeitgeist, it's always a pleasure. Now, let's get back over here and look uh, at... Adam's videos a little bit. Let's listen to a little bit more of what he has to say here. Um, let me just lay it out. David Scribina, there's a debate that uh, Adam plays. It's either in this video, it's in a different video, I think, that I'll, I'll have up here. But his, uh, his, I'm going to lay out his three, the three points of his argument here in just a bit. But essentially, he's saying that uh, is, is that Christianity is a hoax. It's not just a myth but that it's an intentional deception, and that's the line that Adam's taking here. So let's, let's listen just a little bit more here to what he's got to say. Uh, next, we're going to deal with faith and reasons. Let's hear what uh, Adam has to say about Christians and faith. Of Our political leaders of America wouldn't be flying over and bending the knee and kissing the ring and bowing to the wall in Israel without this. And hey, I, no, it's, I'm, I don't disagree on those points, those specific points. The reaction I've gotten, I've also read uh, The Jesus Puzzle by Earl Doherty. This one's been out for like 20 years. I mean, some people like to do research and some people just like to have their comforting uh, security blanket. And we've done the research and we've just given you a, a, very, a very clear uh, refutation of Doherty's thesis. Uh, mythologies that make them feel good. The hopium, in a way. So these books... I'm sure there's going to be uh, comments up on Odyssey. Make sure to subscribe to Odyssey. This will be posted on BitChute. And I'm going to show you some presentations, one from YouTube from David Fitzgerald and another one from David Skirbina in a debate that he had. I'll put the links to the full videos down below. Uh, I'm going to be uploading that in just a minute. We're going to start with about uh, 10 minutes of David Skirbina and a debate he had with a Christian. On, and this debate was specifically, is, is the Christianity a hoax, not just a myth, but a deliberate, intentional deception on the Gentiles? And then we're going to get into, uh, talk about the actual evidence of any eyewitnesses. And when you see how flimsy, you know, we're talking about extraordinary claims, God, resurrection, virgin birth, all of these miracles, dying for your sins, Yom Kippur sacrifice. We're talking about extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary proof. I think what he meant to say was extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? You're, 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 let's, let's, let me let him, I'm going to answer to that in just a minute. But. And the proof is anything but extraordinary when you actually investigate it. So well, let's ask a question. This is a claim you hear from atheists quite a bit. I'm not sure whether Adam's an atheist or not. I don't know anything about Adam really other than what he says here. Uh, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Is this true? Is, is what he said true? Is there a such category of evidence called extraordinary? When you go into a courtroom, uh, is there a such, do you, uh, does the jury say, no, we're going to need uh, extraordinary evidence if we're going to, if we're going to go along with, with your argument? You know, an empty tomb is not all that extraordinary, is it? It's just an empty tomb. Is this the proper approach for someone who is genuinely seeking the truth? I hear this from atheists all the time. Carl Sagan is the one who coined the term or coined the phrase. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, I would say extraordinary... Standards of evidence require 
extraordinary equivocation on the word evidence, right? What, what, how much evidence is enough for you? What is, what is the standard? Where is the line for you? When will you be satisfied? When is there enough evidence to convince you, right? So extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. It's just, it's just gobbledygook. It means nothing. So we ask the question, is making a, a statement like this, no, you have to bring extraordinary evidence. An empty tomb is just an empty tomb. Is this the proper approach for someone who is genuinely seeking truth? Hey, I could respond to this by saying uh, that the claims made by Anna, uh, by, by uh, sorry, Adam and uh, Dr. Skrbina are also extraordinary, right? You're saying that Jesus is a myth. That's an extraordinary claim. It requires extraordinary evidence. But it's a non sequitur. It doesn't follow. Uh, Adam tells us that some people do real research. And if you're not willing to go the extra mile, as he has, then you have no basis. You, you don't, you, you, your opinion shouldn't even be heard. So we have to ask the question. Has Adam gone the extra mile? Is he reading the sources of those who, uh, who he disagrees with? I, maybe he has. I've seen that he's had some... some uh, people that he disagrees with on his on his show maybe he has but where's that where's it led him as we read uh, uh, as we uh, mentioned just a little bit earlier for those who've got their mind made up on an issue like jesus mythicism there's no amount of evidence that's going to convince that person if you want to believe that jesus is a myth that's what you're going to believe Has Adam objectively investigated the positive case for the truth claims of Christianity? Or is Adam violating his own stated standard of engaging both sides of the issue here? Now, that's why I've, I've used as a primary source for this video is this. Did Jesus exist? Uh, the historical argument for Jesus of Nazareth by Bart D. Ehrman. Not an evangelical Christian. Agnostic. He's a practical atheist. But what we want to talk about here for a second, let me see if he says a little bit more about reason. Here. So the links to these books will be down below. Look forward to seeing your comments. It'll be on BitChute, but BitChute is, is uh, and uh, a million times. And when you appear so often, people won't even watch this video. They'll just show up in the comments and say, oh, there's proof. There's Josephus. There's Tacitus. I've heard the Christians say it a million times. And when you actually look at the reality of Josephus and Tacitus, you see that this evidence is actually proof that, that it's not real. What is that evidence? What is that? What is that evidence? We'll talk about Josephus and Tacitus in here, here in just a bit, and many other uh, sources, non-Christian sources. But anyway. Not to mention how many decades later it is. And, and remember that Christians, just so you know, if you're already turning off the video or as soon as we get started here, you want to turn it off and just down thumb, try to have an open mind. I know that the Bible tells you that the Bible says it's the truth, so it's, it must be the truth, right? The Bible says that anybody that doesn't believe it is a fool, as if that's an argument. Anybody that doesn't agree with this foolishness is a fool. And I know that you, the Bible teaches and you believe that anybody that doesn't believe in your Jewish messianism and your salvationism and your blood atonement sacrifices and worship the God of Israel, Yahweh. Anybody that doesn't believe in that is you're taught is antichrist, is the epitome of evil, is the devil incarnate. Is that true, Christian? Are we taught that anyone who doesn't believe like we do is the devil incarnate? That's a bit of a, that's a bit dramatic. Anyway. So that is a mental prison that they have you so you won't examine the evidence. That's what cults do to their... A mental prison they have you in so you won't examine the evidence. So we have a claim here about, we're talking about faith and reason, right? What we're hearing here is, Christian, you, you can't reason properly. You're in a, you're in a mental prison. <clears throat> he says, try to have an open mind. He says, Christians are told to believe, well, he paraphrasing, Christians are just told to believe without evidence. We're told to have a blind faith. Is that true? Uh, let's, we could pull many, but let's just go to, let's go to Isaiah. Let's see what, uh, let's see, uh, Isaiah 1. 
Is there one? Let's start at verse 17, where it says, Your country lies desolate, your cities are burned with fire, in your very presence foreigners devour your land. That's not it. I want to go to 17, not 7. Go a little bit farther down here. There we go. Let's see here. Uh, start at verse 16. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now. Let us reason together. Says the Lord. That is Yahweh. Come now. Let us reason together. Says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be Come like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together. And I thought I might put together about a 15-minute section here on faith and reason and look at all the, the uh, references in Scripture that prove Christians absolutely do not have a blind faith. Uh, faith is trust. Faith is not faith is not believing without evidence. Faith is trust. You all, you, everyone, deals with faith. If you're married, how do you, how do you know your wife loves you? Can you prove that? Adam has constructed a straw man of Christianity here. This is what he thinks Christianity is, but. Let's not blame Adam completely here because it is sad but true that Christians can behave badly. It's like everyone else. Uh, but is it true that Christians are taught to believe blindly? And is it true that we're taught to judge others harshly? And is it true that we're told not to reason toward the truth? Is it true that we're taught to shut off any arguments that challenge our faith? So we just looked at Isaiah 118. Come and let us reason together. But converted people are not objective, right? If you've become a Christian, you're not objective. You can't be objective because faith is blind. At this point, the skeptic might protest. Say, but since the New Testament writers were converted, they can't be objective. Or anyone who's a Christian, you can't be objective, right? Surely that's true. No, it's nonsense. People can be objective even when they aren't neutral. In fact, when it comes to this issue, nobody's neutral. When it comes to objective moral values and duties, nobody is neutral. When it comes to uh, uh, rape and murder, nobody's neutral. A doctor can give an objective uh, diagnosis even if he has strong feelings for the patient. That is, he can be objective even though he isn't neutral. In fact, his passion for the patient may cause him to be all the more diligent in diagnosing and then treating the, the disease properly. Even in, in making these arguments as a Christian, I, as I'm sitting here talking to you as a, a follower of Jesus Christ myself, proud of it, uh, uh, happy, blessed to be here to be able to do this work uh, I'm certainly not neutral right but uh, I am presenting objective facts that's the goal here that's the duty likewise though atheists or even mythicists are not neutral but they too can present objective facts if they decide to do it the New Testament writers were capable of of the same. To say, for, for Adam to say that Christians can't be objective, what about him? He has a belief system. Can he be objective? The truth of the matter is that all books are written for a reason, all arguments are made for a reason. And when everyone, when, when anyone says anything, offers any kind of a statement, Certainly they believe in what they're saying or what they're writing. They believe it to be true. But that doesn't mean that what they write or say 
is wrong or has no objective element. This distinction between neutrality and the objectivity of the New Testament writers is an extremely important point. Too often the documents that make up the New Testament are automatically considered biased and untrustworthy. This is ironic because those who hold this view are often biased themselves. They are biased because they have not first sincerely investigated, as Adam asked all of us to do, the New Testament documents or the context in which they were written in order to make an educated assessment of their trustworthiness. And anyone who looks at this evidence objectively, you have to admit, the New Testament is a reliable. It's as reliable as anything from history. The New Testament documents are not church propaganda, and they're not some monolith of writings that are designed to promote some church-manufactured theology. But what is? what are the New Testament documents then? We'll deal with that a little more later tonight. But we know we have an accurate copy of what was written down by the New Testament writers. But are those documents trustworthy? As we deal with that, we're going to talk about how history is done. How do we know New Testament documents are trustworthy? Before we get there, another, another note about faith and reason. Now, atheists will often chide Christians, or even Jesus mythicists like this will chide Christians about the concept of faith and the part it plays in a Christian's belief system. For example, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote this. He said, quote, When faith is thus exalted above everything else, it necessarily follows that reason, knowledge, and patient inquiry have to be discredited. The road to truth becomes a forbidden road. Faith means not wanting to know what is true. This comes from his, his book, The Antichrist, in 1888. You want to hear that last sentence again? Knowledge and patient inquiry have to be discredited if you're a person of faith, says Friedrich Nietzsche, atheist. The road to truth becomes a forbidden road. He says, faith means not wanting to know what is true. Interesting, right? In the same vein, atheistic philosopher uh, Peter Bogosian, in his book, uh, A Manual for Creating Atheists, separates faith from reason, asserting that faith is, quote, pretending to know things that you don't know. And also, quote, belief without evidence. He calls faith an unreliable epistemology. He calls faith a virus. Both Nietzsche and Bogosian are clearly incorrect in their assertions about faith and its relationship to reason and truth. They use a distorted redefinition of faith and wrongly assert that it is an epistemology. Epistemology is a system or study about how one acquires knowledge. How do you know anything? Faith, properly defined, is trust that is developed through the acquisition of prior information. Adam Green is showing a tremendous amount of faith in the Jesus mythicists he has on his channel to interview. Showing a tremendous amount of faith in having them on there. Showing a tremendous amount of faith in holding to that position himself. He's trusting these arguments. Reason is part of the formula of faith. And reason is part of the formula that is used to gather the information and accept or reject a truth claim. In the scriptures, reason and faith are seen working together in many places. And we've shared some here. So let's look at some more examples from scripture where reason and faith are working together. Because I think it's very important as we're dealing with Jesus' mythicism, let's, let's, let's handle. You know, Christian, do you believe without evidence? In the book of Acts, the author records six times. This is in Acts 17, 2. Uh, Acts 17, 17. Acts 18, 4. On and on. Let's, let's look at one of them. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. This is uh, Paul in Athens. I think this is Mars Hill, right? Acts 17. Acts 17, 2. 
Acts 17, chapter 2. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. On down in verse 17. This is Paul uh, uh, speaking to pagans. Uh, Acts 17, 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue, well, in the synagogue here with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So the Jews in the synagogue, he's dealing with the pagans in the marketplace. We're going down to Acts uh, 18, 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. On into Acts chapter 19, just some examples. Acts chapter 19, uh, verse 8. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, that's the, so that's the followers of Jesus, before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. The apostle Paul Reasoned or was reasoning with his audiences. Moreover, in Acts chapter 9, verse 29, Paul is arguing with his opponents. In Acts 14, 1, he spoke in such a manner that a large number of unbelievers were converted. So the use of reason and logical argumentation like that of Paul results in one of two outcomes, either rejection or acceptance. With the latter being where faith comes in. Now, regarding faith, the definitions that atheistic philosophers, Jesus mythicists even use, are foreign to the true biblical meaning of the term faith. In the Greek New Testament, the word pistis is used. That's the underlying text. If you want to know what Scripture is saying, you need to look at the language it was written in. Pistis is a noun that comes from the verb uh, piatho, meaning to be persuaded. So faith means to be persuaded. According to the best Greek lexicons, the word translated as faith means a state of believing on the basis of the reliability of the one trusted. So what is a primary element of faith for a Christian? It's trust. It's, and, and, and how do you gain that trust? Through reliability. Trust, confidence, that which evokes trust, reliability, fidelity, pertaining to being worthy of belief or trust. Pertaining to being worthy of belief or trust. This is uh, the same is true of the Hebrew term for faith, which denotes firmness, trustworthiness, constancy, duration, and truth. So the underlying Hebrew word for faith means truth. Faith is summed up in Hebrews 11, 1 this way. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith relies on substance and evidence. As in the way a husband has complete faith and trust in his wife. Although he may not be able to demonstrate that faith in some empirical manner for others, he certainly knows it to be true. In the end, the proper way to view reason and faith is to understand that faith is trust given in response to acquired knowledge. So where does faith come from? It comes from a study, from seeking the truth. And thus arriving at faith involves reason and a commitment to the truth. All right, so this uh, brings us around to another point where uh, we'll have to deal with this. To their members, teach you, don't listen to the outside world. Don't listen to anybody disputing that. Don't listen to anybody that will get you to question your own beliefs. It's, that's not the way to real objective truth. So if you have faith, you don't know what truth is, according to Adam. Now, we've just explained to you, what is faith in the context of Scripture, what, is the, what does faith mean to the Christian? It certainly doesn't mean believing without evidence. It means trust based on reliability. 
But now earlier on he, here, he said, I, 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 I skipped over a segment here that I meant to cover, which is Zionism. What is Zionism and what is Christian Zionism? It's spoken of, it's spoken about quite a lot. And that's, uh, well, uh, well one, of the, one of the evils, one of the, one of those things that Adam and, and Scribina and others have identified as being one of the, one of the evils. In the world. But what is it? What is it? You hear people talk about it. You hear people getting emotional about it. What is it? Zionism is simply a political movement at its inception when it began, but today has become more of an ideology. It is like a religion itself. Zionism is an international movement for the return of the Jewish people to Zion, Zion being the land of Israel, the original land while exercising the right to retain authority of government over the state of Israel, which was promised to them in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, the roots for Zionism lie in Genesis chapters 12 and 15, in which God makes a covenant with Abraham, promising him that his descendants would inherit the land between Egypt and the Euphrates River. Now, due to the fact that Zionism was begun as a politically motivated movement, there exists among secular Gentiles a non-religious and non-religious Jews a line of thought stating that the religious background of the Jewish people had nothing to do with Zionism. It is argued that Zionism was instead a reaction of the Jewish people to worldwide persecution during World Wars I and II. No nation would take them in, so they were forced to create their own nation, the land of their ancestry being the most opportune place. Now, this is just a definition. What you believe and what you think about it, that's, that's up to you. But regardless... The Zionist movement, begun in the late 1890s, found fulfillment in 1948 when the state of Israel was officially recognized and granted sovereignty as a nation by the United Nations. Now, this is when technically the political Zionist movement ended and the ideology of Zionism began, and as such has become a much debated topic, obviously. Some would say that Zionism has become a motivation for racism, or a reaction against anti-Semitism. Others believe that Zionism, as it currently exists, is just Jewish patriotism. So you'll find many, many ideas, many opinions out there about what is Zionism, what does it really mean. But now, moving on down, Christian Zionism. Now that's simply Gentile support of Jewish Zionism as based on the promises to Israel found in the Bible. Now the argument here. From, from Green and, and those, who, uh, th those who he appealed to to, uh, to support his arguments uh, would be that it is a great deception, that Gentiles who support the Jewish nation have been deceived into doing so. And one of the ways they've been deceived into doing that is through the hoax of Christianity. Christian Zionists are primarily evangelical and give support in any way possible to the Jewish state of Israel. The return of the Jews to the promised land is the fulfillment of prophecy and is seen especially by dispensationalists as a sign that the world has entered the end times. All right, this is just definitions. So we have to ask the question now. As Christians, should you stand with the state of Israel? Should you stand with the people of Israel? Is Israel the nation, the people, are they the chosen people? And what has the Apostle Paul told us? Did he tell us that God is not done with Israel? We looked at this the other day, Romans chapter 11. Now this might not be any sort of evidence for those who are convinced one way or the other. But uh, as we look at Romans chapter 11, verse 25, through 29, it says, Lest you be wise in your own sight. Now, this is Paul talking to the church, the people at Rome. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will 
banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Romans eleven twenty eight. 28. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So how do we think about it? As Christians, we ought to support any nation that holds to the word of God. What do you see going on in Israel at the moment? Even though Israel now is sadly secular in many ways, most of the people there are. Uh, seemed, uh, if you look at uh, census, they seem to be about 80% atheists today. So Israel is sadly secular in many ways and has not received Jesus as the Messiah. God has told us that there will come a time when Israel will be used of God again. And after all, it says all of Israel will be saved. So, of course, it's proper to pray for any nation, any group of people who have apostatized, who are not, who have rejected God. Yeah, it's, pro it's appropriate to pray uh, for people in apostasy, but be very careful not to support a movement in every aspect or a people or a nation in every aspect just because of the name, just because of who they are. As Christians, we're only to support the nation or the people insofar as it is biblical. Now, this brings up, once again, it's, it's a good uh, opportunity to mention replacement theology. Once again, something known as super supersessionism that teaches that the church, meaning the Christian church, has replaced Israel in God's plan. This is replacement theology. Adherents of replacement theology believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people, and God does not have specific future plans for the nation of Israel. Among the different views of the relationship between the church and Israel are the church has replaced Israel. This is replacement theology. Or the church is an expansion of Israel. That's covenant theology. Or the church is completely different and distinct from Israel, that is dispensationalism, or also known as premillennialism. Replacement theology teaches that the church is the replacement for Israel, and that the many promises made to Israel in the Bible are fulfilled in the Christian church, not in Israel. The prophecies in Scripture concerning the blessing and restoration of Israel to the promised land are spiritualized or allegorized into promises of God's blessing for the church. There are problems with this, uh, with this view such as the continuing existence of the Jewish people. For one thing, they're still here and have made it throughout the centuries, and especially with the revival of the modern state of Israel. If Israel has been condemned by God and there is no future for the uh, Jewish nation, how do we explain what appears to be the supernatural survival of the Jewish people over the past 2,000 years, despite many attempts to destroy them? This has nothing to do with whether or not you like them or support what they're doing politically or spiritually. It has nothing to do with that. How do you explain the reappearance of the nation in the 20th century after not existing for nearly 2,000 years? Now, the view that Israel and the church are different is clearly taught in the New Testament. Biblically speaking, the church is distinct from Israel, and the terms church and Israel are never to be confused or are used interchangeably. We're taught from Scripture that the church is an entirely new creation that came into being on the day of Pentecost and will continue until it is taken uh, into heaven at the rapture. Ephesians 1, 9, 1 Thessalonians 4. The church has no relationship to the curses and blessings for Israel. The covenants, promises, and warnings of the Mosaic Covenant were valid only for Israel. Israel has been temporarily set aside in God's program during these past 2,000 years of dispersion. Once again, we see this in Romans chapter 11. Now, these are definitions, folks. You, your church, might, you might be a dispensationalist church. You might, you might be a covenant theology church. We're just defining our terms here. But now, contrary to replacement theology, dispensationalism teaches that after the rapture, God will restore Israel as the primary focus of His plan. The first event at this time is the time of trouble, such as never been seen, or the tribulation, mentioned in Revelations chapter 6 through 19. At the time, the world will be judged 
for rejecting Christ, while Israel is prepared through the trials of the Great Tribulation for the second coming of the Messiah. Then, when Christ does return to the earth at the end of the Tribulation, Israel would be ready to receive Him. Uh, the remnant of Israel who survived the Tribulation will be saved, and the Lord will establish His kingdom on this earth with Jerusalem as its capital. With Christ reigning as King, Israel will be the leading nation, and representatives from all nations will come to Jerusalem to honor and worship the King. Jesus Christ. The church will return with Christ and will reign with Him for a literal thousand years. Now this is the the millennium reign of Christ. There's a video here on this channel that explains the three or four views on the millennium uh, when it is, if it is. But now both the Old Testament and the New Testament support this uh, premillennial dispensational understanding of God's plan for Israel. The strongest support is found in the clear teaching of Revelation 20, verses 1 through 7, where it says six times that Christ's kingdom will last a thousand years. After the tribulation, the Lord will return and establish His kingdom with the nation of Israel. Christ will reign over the whole earth, and Israel will be the leader of the nations. Now, does that have anything to do with whether or not they're behaving badly right now? Are, are any of us good? The church will reign with him for a literal thousand years. The church has not replaced Israel in God's plan in this theology. While God may be focusing his attention primarily on the Christian church in this dispensation of grace, at this time, well, God, has, it's, it's, God hasn't forgotten Israel and one day will restore Israel to his intended role as the nation he has chosen. And as Christians, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you have a You have a very harsh view of Israel or the, or the, the nation or the people of Israel. Uh, that doesn't really have anything to do with what Scripture is teaching us, what Scripture is telling us. I would uh, suggest to be very careful about where your heart leads you on that issue. You don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Now, let's introduce uh, David Skirbina. This is... Uh, gentleman that Adam has uh, had on his channel at least once, I think a couple, maybe a couple times, but at least once. Scribina is a uh, Jesus mythicist. His PhD was a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Michigan, Dearborn from 2003 to 2018. He taught a graduate course in technology and sustainability at the University of Helsinki in the uh, fall of 2020. His areas of interest include philosophy of mind, eco-philosophy, philosophy of technology, and environmental ethics. Now, if we want to, let's see here, where are we? I want to lay out Skrbina's central argument, the three points. And I think many of you guys know that. And... Uh... Let's get started here. David Skirbina, his presentation. Here we go. And this whole thing will be up without my commentary on BitChute and then on Odyssey with my commentary. So sign up. Links are below. My central argument is pretty, pretty simple. This is it in a nutshell. Uh, there was very likely the, the fact that there was no biblical Jesus. Okay, uh, it's one. almost certainly the case. Number one, it was almost certainly the case that there was no biblical Jesus. That, 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 that Jesus mentioned in the Bible. He says almost certainly did not exist. Okay, that's the first part of his argument. Later on in time, they, someone, said that there was. They. But who they was. Somebody lied. Okay, those are the three points. That's it. That's it. He says that there's very, very likely no biblical Jesus. But later on, someone said there was. Therefore, someone lied. Well, it's logical. Is it true? Can it be supported with the evidence? Scribina has suggested that there simply is no evidence for Jesus existing. Mythicists do this all the time. They say there is no evidence for Jesus existing. When you offer them evidence, they say that evidence doesn't count. It's no good. So is it true? Can we know and say anything meaningful about Jesus as a real historical person? Because as we said from the start, if Jesus, really existed, 
the mythicist movement, all, all of this, this entire argument, all of these videos, they fall. They're meaningless. So let's just ask agnostic, practically an atheist, uh, and renowned New Testament scholar from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Bart Ehrman, to help us with this. Let's go to a New Testament scholar who is not biased toward Christianity because there exists an enormous range of opinions about who Jesus is and was and what his intentions may or may not have been. But Jesus was very clear about who he was and his purpose. So if the New Testament docu documents can be shown to be reliable, then the claims Jesus made are world-changing. Okay, so let's see. First of all, let me make this a little bigger for you. In his book, Did Jesus Exist? Bart Ehrman writes on page 12, Despite this enormous range of opinion, there are several points on which virtually all scholars of antiquity, that's people who study history, agree. Jesus was a Jewish man, known to be a preacher and teacher, who was crucified, which is, of course is a most humiliating form of Roman execution, in Jerusalem during the reign of Roman Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. Even though this is the view of nearly every trained scholar on the planet, it is not the view of a group of writers who are usually labeled and often labeled themselves as mythicists. Now, regardless of the reason one claims mythicism, the evidence must be confronted objectively. <laughs> Whatever your opinion is on this, the evidence has to be treated objectively. Even if you don't like where it takes you. Even if one dislikes or otherwise is suspicious of the Jews now or throughout history, you still have to confront the evidence objectively. Now on uh, page 14, Ehrman, right, I got the wrong page reference there. This is page 14 of Did Jesus Exist? Ehrman says, I want to stress the most foundational point of all. Jesus himself was not a myth. He really existed. Now, as we move onward in this presentation toward evidence and refuting some of the claims we've heard, uh, or some of the claims of mythicism itself, let's get a feel for the Jesus mythicist movement and what are their general claims before we dive into uh, the refutation of the claims offered by Scribina and repeated by Adam here. So let's look at a, a brief history of mythicism. Now, this is not a traditional position or movement, meaning that uh, Jesus' mythicism was not a position that can be found among any writers or historians from the first century up until the 18th century. That means, that means, nobody questioned whether Jesus really existed until at some point in the late 1700s. Therefore, we have to question if Jesus was a myth concocted by the Jews in antiquity before the first century or at some time during the first or second or third centuries, why did no one write about it? Where are the historical documents uh, charging the Jews with this obvious fabrication, if it's true? The truth is that there are no known writings for the first 1,800 years that have even suggested that Jesus of Nazareth was not a real person. Now, you see here on, uh, this is actually a, on page 25 of Ehrman's book. No, no, this is a different, it's a different quote. He says, on page 14, he says, The first author to deny the existence of Jesus appears to have been the 18th century Frenchman, Constantin Francois Volney, a member of the Constituent Assembly during the French Revolution. In 1791, Volney published an essay called Ruins of Empire, and in it he argued that all religions at heart are the same. What's the point here? Not for 1,800 years did anyone make the claim. So this is a position that has become very popular in the 20th century, especially by men such as Joseph Campbell, who assert that Christianity is merely a variant on the one universal religion and that early Christians created Jesus as a kind of sun god, 
we've dealt with that in, in Zeitgeist. Uh, more would follow. However, they seem to repeat the same standard argument that Christianity was simply astrotheology personified. It wasn't until the year 1900 that an English-speaking scholar made the claim that Jesus was a myth. British rationalist J.M. Robertson published a work titled Christianity and Mythology, where he made the now common claim that Christianity was simply an expression of pagan religions that venerated pagan gods of fertility who die and rise again with the seasons. There was a long break in this mythicist movement until the contemporary promoters came on the scene led by a man by the name of Earl Doherty, which we dealt with earlier in this show. Uh, he would be one of the primary mythicists in the modern period. Now, in, in Adam's video, he mentioned Doherty as one of his sources for his own position as a Jesus mythicist. Adam showed us the book he used titled G The Jesus Puzzle, Did Christianity Begin with a Mythical Christ? Now, although Doherty is seen as a leading representative for the mythicist movement, he possesses no advanced degrees in biblical studies or any related field. Now, this is not an appeal to authority. It's just important, right? It's relevant. So we don't want to dismiss his work by making an appeal to authority, but it is relevant to point this out. Likewise, Dr. Skrbina is similarly, uh, similarly lacking with his academic concentrations being in mathematics, technology, and sustainability, and his primary areas of interest, or philosophy, of course, and his primary areas of interest, including a, a philosophy of mind, eco-philosophy, philosophy of technology, and environmental ethics. Two, highly trained scholars with relevant training in the field who are active today in the Jesus mythicist movement our PhDs Robert Price and Richard Carrier, who are easily found online, debating the topic with many and some of the best Christian debaters, apologists. There are others, of course, but Price and Carrier are likely the most recognizable and reasonable names active in the debate today. Now, Bart Ehrman on page... Uh, 20 and 21 of his book, Did Jesus Exist? He says this, It is fair to say that mythicists as a group and as individuals are not taken seriously by the vast majority of scholars in the fields of New Testament, early Christianity, ancient history, and theology. A number of other mythicists, however, do not offer anything resembling scholarship in support of their view and instead present the unsuspecting reading public with sensationalist claims that are so extravagant, so wrong-headed, and so poorly substantiated that it is no wonder that scholars, and many others, simply don't take them seriously. If scholars take note of them at all, it is simply out of amazement that such inaccuracies and poorly researched publications could ever see the published light of day. This is not a fundamentalist evangelical Christian speaking, folks. This is New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman. Atheist. Uh, agnostic, I think he would call himself. In fact, Bart Arman used to be a fundamentalist Christian in his younger uh, in his younger life. So even that even that even makes the case even stronger. Now, Zeitgeist once again comes up in this argument, this presentation, this conversation. Zeitgeist as an egregious, irresponsible error at best, and at worst, Zeitgeist is an outright deception. Now, as for the moment, or as this movement and the claims that are made by the wildly popular 2007 truther documentary called Zeitgeist, the errors and outright baseless and utterly false claims are plentiful. They're abundant. They're all through it. And we've dealt with some of these already, but we can deal with just a few here to set the record straight, coming from Bart Ehrman's book. Where he tells us here that some of the claims are that the Gospels were forged hundreds of years after the events they narrate. We'll hear this from the mythicist movement here, we'll, um, that the Gospels were written so far after Jesus existed that why didn't someone write about it when it happened? That's one of the arguments, and that's a good question. 
But is that what happened? Uh, in fact, the Gospels were written at the end of the first century, about 35 to 65 years after Jesus' death. And we have physical proof. One fragment of a Gospel manuscript dates to the early second century. That's early 100s. How could it have been forged centuries after that? Another one of the claims is that we have no manuscript of the New Testament that dates prior to the 4th century. This is just plain wrong, according to Bart Ehrman. We have numerous fragmentary manuscript manuscripts that date from the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Uh, another claim is that the autographs, or the originals, were destroyed after the Council of Nicaea. You hear that? You know, Constantine created Christianity, you'll hear in point of fact, we have no knowledge of what happened to the original copies of the New Testament. They were probably simply used so much that they wore out. There is not a scintilla of evidence to suggest that they survived until Nicaea or that they were destroyed afterward. Plenty of counter-evidence indicates that they did not survive until Nicaea. And of course, we dealt with this, that the true meaning of the word gospel is God spell, as in magic, hypnosis, and delusion uh, from Acharya S., from the Christ conspiracy. No, the word gospel comes to us from the old English term uh, God's spell, which means good news. A fairly precise translation of the Greek word uh, eogelon. Okay, that's a tough one to say. It has nothing to do with magic. So, there's just a couple more. I, I'm not, I'll try to, I'll try to hold myself back from going after Zeitgeist anymore tonight. But to make this clear, to bring this, to bring this on home here, Bart Arman writes on page 25 of Did Jesus Exist? Right here. In short, if there is any conspiracy here, it is on the part of modern authors who make up stories about the ancient Christians and what they believed about Jesus. If there's any conspiracy here at all, it is on the part of modern authors who make up stories about the ancient Christians and what they believed about Jesus. Likewise, nearly all of the claims made in the Zeitgeist Movement and by, and by Jesus mythicists have no basis in reality and cannot be supported by anything other than conjecture. The main thesis of a Jesus mythicist is that the story of Jesus is not the biography of a historical Messiah, but a myth based on perennial pagan stories. Now, that's not exactly the claim that's being made here by Scubina and, and Adam Green. But it is one of the common ones. Christianity, they'll say that Christianity was not a new and unique revelation, but actually a Jewish adaptation of the ancient pagan mystery religion. Or they would say in this case that Christianity was not new and unique, but it was just a creation by the Jewish leaders to ensnare Gentiles. The argument goes on to draw exact similarities between what are known to be pagan myths and the historical Jesus. Born of a virgin on December 25th, three shepherds or wise men come to visit. They did miracles like turning water into wine, rode into town triumphantly on a donkey, were crucified or sacrificed in the spring of the year, were resurrected. However, atheists and Christian scholars of history alike scoff at these silly assertions. Those who propagate these tales as truth offer no evidence for the claims. And we've, seen, we've seen evidence of that already with Acharya S. They cite no sources from the ancient world that could be checked for veracity. As Bart Ehrman states on page 26 of his book, no such evidence exists. Once again, what would you need for evidence that Jesus was a myth? What you would need... At, at, if it was a first century myth, a myth created in the first century, or even the third or fourth or fifth, to ensnare the Gentiles, someone should have picked up on that before 1900. The common mythicist assertions, as Bart Ehrman says, no such evidence exists for them. Now, Adam's sources here, uh, Scribina and Doherty included, uh, as well as most uh, mythicists, claim that there are no reliable references to the existence of Jesus in any non-Christian sources of the first century, that no Greek or Roman author mentions him for over 80 years after that. 
Is it true? As Adam has done, they will complain. If Jesus was such an important figure, we should find references to him in some of our historical sources of the period. Right? In the time that Jesus was supposed to have lived there, someone should have written something about him if he was real. Right? That's what they'll say. And they say there, are, they say there is no evidence. That's what Scribina says. In the, in the, and you, you can find the, that debate on YouTube if you'd like. You can just search for it. So the claim here and the claim made by most, most mythicists is that there is no evidence for Jesus in any historical writings. Uh, Adam Green has complained that uh, Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian who was loyal to the Roman Empire, cannot be counted as a real source, even though he does mention Jesus, the founder of the faith. The complaint is that the references made by Josephus in his history, titled The Jewish Antiquities, cannot be counted as evidence, and likewise the writings of Pliny, a Roman governor in AD 112, and the writings of Roman historians Tacitus and Suetonius, who make direct mentions of the Jesus, are not valid sources. So once again, they'll tell you there's no evidence for Jesus, but when you offer them the evidence, that that evidence doesn't count. The mythicist's claim is that the references to Jesus were inserted by others and not the original writings of these authors, a claim that requires evidence. They also claim that Jesus isn't even mentioned in the early Christian writings outside of the New Testament documents. They claim that the Apostle Paul says little to nothing at all about the historical Jesus. And if this is true, it would mean that all we have to know uh, anything about Jesus are the four Gospels. On top of that, they claim that what is written in the Gospels cannot be taken seriously because they do not measure up to a modern expectation of of historical documentation. Now, that's a, a, a word about what's what's in the, the mindset of of the mythicists in general, like Scribina. I'm not gonna just not really gonna be dealing with whether you know the, the idea. What, what I mean, why should we deal with the claim that Christianity was a was a a, a Jewish deception to ensnare Gentiles? Because if we can just show that Jesus existed. That whole thing falls apart. Now, so let's think about this. A word about how history is done as an academic discipline. Before we do that, let me just go ahead and share this with you. Let me. This is uh, this is James White here, but let me just show show you uh, Bart Ehrman, the uh, New Testament scholar who we've been talking about here uh, so far. I'm let you hear him say how much evidence there is for uh, the New Testament documents uh, historic, first uh, historically. Instant manuscript copies, very enormous. <clears throat> sort of ginormous would be a good one. Ginormous. Ginormous. Okay. Uh, I mean, ginormous <laughs> doesn't cover it. Uh, the New Testament we have much earlier uh, attestation than for any other book from antiquity. What you can't do is. Okay. then say, well, then you can't trust any book from antiquity. Okay, yes, right, that's right. So, okay. uh, that's right. so it can. would be correct to, to write a book called Misquoting Suetonius? Absolutely. Scholar okay, so the point here is, uh, well, from Ehrman, we're hearing very clearly that the New Testament documents are the most well-attested documents from antiquity. What does that mean? I'll give you a, a more uh, detailed description of what that actually means in just a, a little bit later in this. So, but first, we want to do a, a, give you a word about how history is actually done, right? Because what is the poll question today? Once again, let's revisit it as we get into understanding a little bit about how history is done. Now, I know this one's going to go long, folks. I hope you've got your popcorn ready. Paul, the poll question was, was Jesus of Nazareth a real flesh and blood man who lived in first century Palestine? 133 people have voted so far. You can vote if you'd like. Go to, go to the YouTube channel, the community tab. You'll see it there. Or just click on the link that's pinned to the top of the live chat. Was Jesus a real man? Did he live? 133 votes. 95% of people say yes. Nobody Nobody says no. 
But 5% of you say it's impossible to know anything that happened in history. In other words, you can't know history. Pat Reed says he's still living in the kingdom of heaven. Ashley M. says Jesus, Yahushua, Yahshua, Yeshua. Uh, and uh, looking for some comments from some folks who are not believers too. But we'd, I appreciate you guys weighing in on that tonight. 133 votes. Let's get some more. Now, a word about how history is done. If we're going to deal with the claims from Jesus mythicists, uh, even this smaller fringe group of Jesus mythicists who will tell you that it was a dis Jewish deception meant to ensnare Gentiles, if we can show that Jesus was a real historical figure, then all of that falls apart. That's the only part of the argument we need to attack. All right, and it's the easiest. So let's do it. How is history done as an academic discipline? How do we gather information and learn and know anything at all about history? Should the Gospels, should the New Testament itself, the New Testament document, should they, should, should the Gospels and the account of Jesus being, uh, the accounts of Jesus being considered, uh, should they be considered invalid simply because there are those who believe that Jesus is a myth or because they feel that miracles are impossible? Should you discredit New Testament documents because miracles are in them? Well, the answer obviously is no. So what kind of evidence do professional historians require in order to determine whether or not an event is historical? Or at least, how do, how do professional historians determine whether something is history or not? Or at least, what is the best possible explanation for the circumstances? In short, how do we know anything at all about the past? I'm speaking to the, right now, I'm speaking to the 5% of you out there who believe that it's impossible to know what happened in history. Uh, you're not exactly wrong. It might be impossible to know, to know uh, with absolute certainty. You can't prove things. Proof is not a concept for history. Proof is not a concept that you employ in any part of your life. Proof is, is, is a mathematical concept. Uh, that's where proof lives. Now, uh, Bart Ehrman writes on pages 92 and 93 of his book, Did Jesus Exist? I'm going to put this quote back up there. I like to keep this one. Keep this one up here. He says, If historians prefer lots of witnesses that corroborate one another's claims without showing evidence of collaboration, we have that in relative abundance in the written sources that attest to the existence of the historical Jesus. Most significant, uh, uh, most significant of all are oral traditions that had been in circulation for years among communities of Christians in different parts of the world. So the question is, why didn't someone write something about the existence of Jesus? You've discounted oral tradition, an enormous part of history. Ehrman goes on to say, uh, most significant of all are oral traditions that had been in circulation for years among communities of Christians in different parts of the world, all of them attesting to the existence of Jesus. Some of these originated in the 30s A.D. Some of these originated in the... When was Jesus? When, when was Jesus crucified and, and rose? It was in approximately... 34 A.D. It's debated. What does that mean? That just means that it's within only a few years, at least, of the traditional date of the death of Jesus. Not, I'm not telling you this is my opinion. This is the opinion of the New Testament scholar. Atheist Bart Ehrman. The vast network of these traditions... Numerically significant, widely dispersed, and largely independent of one another makes it almost certain that whatever one wants to say about Jesus, at the very least one must say that he certainly existed. Moreover, there is yet even more evidence. That is, for anyone who is committed to seeking the truth of the matter rather than engaging in an exercise of emotional confirmation bias.
We have to be careful of that, don't we? Now, we're going to go back and defer to historian Mike Lacona, who is the associate professor in theology at Houston Baptist University, a real historian and a scholar in his relevant field, explains the process of how do we get history? How do we know anything about history now? There are six things that historians look to uh, look to affirm when determining the historical reliability of any any document or writing or event. Number one, they want to know does the author th that the author intended to write an accurate account. Can the author be trusted? The majority of scholars today affirm that the Gospels are consistent with the genre of biography. This means that the Gospels are written in the style and with context of other reliable historical documents. For example, Ronald Miller at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles, refers to Plutarch as, quote, the greatest of all ancient biographers. No one questions Plutarch, do they? Plutarch reports in one case that his writings on figures from 150 years earlier are reliable because the source material is textually pure. Now, this is very important when we think about New Testament manuscripts. You'll find out why later. The New Testament Gospels were written conservatively only 35 to 60 years after the time of Jesus. It's likely that they were written much earlier, and there exists fragmentary evidence to support earlier dating, even back within the same generation. But we will, uh, we're will we going to be here as conservative as possible given the nature of the objections that we're dealing with here. Uh, this is well within the same generation as the events reported in the New Testament. Another point to be made here is that the New Testament writers did not omit embarrassing details. Like Jesus' brothers did not believe in him during his ministry. They didn't, they didn't believe what he was saying. This is an embarrassing fact. And this info would have been very damaging to a first century Jew. So the suggestion here is that the intent of the writers was to give an accurate account. Not leaving out embarrassing details. Secondly, once again, we're talking about six things historians look to affirm in determining the historical reliability of any document or writing. The first one was they want to, they want to find out, did the author that he intended to write an accurate account? Secondly, the author used good judgment in his choice of sources. It is widely affirmed among scholars uh, that the source for Mark's gospel was Jesus' close apostle, Peter. A majority of scholars agree that Luke and its sequel, Acts, used as a primary source Mark's gospel. Those who were intimately familiar with Jesus. A, a majority of scholars agree that John's gospel was written by an eyewitness to the events reported. Very likely it was John himself or that an eyewitness was the primary source. Therefore, contrary to the claims of the Gospels being fabricated decades, hundreds of years after the events, and passed around by word of mouth by unknown individuals or created from whole cloth as a conspiracy, don't hold water. The authors clearly used reliable sources. The evidence suggests that Mark, Luke, and John were based on eyewitness testimony. The third, the third thing that uh, historians look for when determining historical reliability of a document or a source, they want to know that the author used good judgment in his use of these sources. And closely related to that is the fourth thing that the historians look for, and that is that the author and his sources were capable of reporting accurately. So if you had been there, think about this, if you had been there and had seen the events and the miracles that Jesus performed, he gave sight to the blind, he healed the paralyzed, he raised the dead, you saw him arrested, sentenced to death, killed in the most humiliating way possible, crucifixion, of course, a method of torturous death, of which there are no reports of anyone ever surviving. And then you saw him three days later, healthy, vibrant, very much alive, having risen from that grave. 
Do you think something like that would leave an impression on you? Also, think, what if you had the opportunity to walk with Jesus? For three, three and a half years. And hear the same set of sermons and teachings over and over and over again. Hundreds and hundreds of times. You were there with him as hordes of people followed and tried to get close enough to touch him. You shared intimate moments of personal triumph. And in and great suffering. You were there when Jesus knew that he was soon going to face devastatingly painful and humiliating death. According to his human nature. And you were there when he asked you to keep watch and pray with him. And then after Jesus' ascension, you took your command to go make disciples of the nations and went out into the known world and preached the same messages that you had heard him preach over and over and over to crowds of sometimes receptive people, maybe more often to crowds of often angry people who wanted you dead too. You would not forget these things. These events in your life would leave an impression that you would never forget. It seems clear that if any part of the New Testament documents can be shown to be reliable and historically accurate, that it deserves a more careful and serious consideration than these gentlemen we've looked at here tonight have presented. In fact, if you're throwing out the New Testament documents and disqualifying them as a hoax, or a bad game of telephone. Then you cannot speak confidently about any event of ancient history. You're going to have an impossible time making your case that Jesus didn't exist if you can't trust anything from history. Number five. What uh, historians look for when they're trying to determine the historical reliability of any document or writing. Number five is they want to know can we, ver uh, can we verify uh, the numerous items reported? Now, in the New Testament documents, there are countless examples that reflect existing knowledge about the setting where the New Testament events occurred. In other words, what it's talking about reflects the actual known history of the time and place. This means that the Gospels do not contradict other known histories. Rather, they reflect what is written elsewhere outside the New Testament. What this tells us is that those who wrote these letters, biographies and exhortations, were intimately familiar with the area. They were familiar with the towns and the customs and the governments and the leaders and the people of the area, Palestine and around the time Jesus lived. Additionally, there exists corroboration of these accounts from many sources who were not sympathetic to the Christians. And now we come to this point where Adam made early on, uh, showed that Adam said uh, early, back early on in this stream, you can't, you can't trust, you can't trust these external sources. You can't trust Josephus and Tacitus. He says if you're using those sources, uh, they don't count. Well, we're going to talk about those sources, but those are not the only sources. <clears throat> Lucian of Samosata was a second century Greek satirist. In one of his works, he wrote of the early Christians this way. He said, quote, The Christians worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that, count, on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. Who's he talking about? Let's go ahead and deal with Tacitus while we're here. A source that uh, historian Edwin uh, Yamauchi calls, quote, probably the most important reference to Jesus outside the New Testament. Reporting on Emperor Nero's decision to blame the Christians for the fire that had destroyed Rome in A.D. 64, the Roman historian Tacitus uh, wrote this. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from 
whom the name had its uh, origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Now, we can learn something from this ancient, unsympathetic reference to Jesus and the early Christians. Tacitus reports Christians derive their name from a historical person called Christus, which is Latin for Christ. He said that he suffered the extreme penalty, crucifixion, of course, during the reign of Emperor Tiberius. It's interesting, too, that if you find out there's more written about Jesus than there was about Emperor Tiberius. Now, that's anecdotal. I'm not offering that as scholarly, but there's more written about Jesus than there is even about the emperor of the day. But anyway, this confirms much of what the Gospels tell us about the death of Jesus. But Tacitus also reports that Christ's death briefly slowed what he called a most mischievous superstition. Which had, arisen, uh, which had arisen in Judea and in Rome. One historian suggests that Tacitus is here bearing indirect testimony to the conviction of the early church that the Christ, who had been crucified, had risen from the grave. While this interpretation is admittedly speculative, about the resurrection anyway, it does help explain the otherwise bizarre occurrence of a rapidly growing religion based on the worship of a man who had been crucified as a criminal. Now, how else do you explain this? Another source outside the New Testament, Pliny. This is Pliny the Younger, as he's known. Pliny was a Roman governor of uh, Bithynia in Asia Minor, which is now known as Turkey. In the letters of Pliny... To Emperor Trajan, uh, one of them is dated around the, the year uh, 112, A.D. 112. Pliny asks Trajan's advice about the what is the appropriate way to conduct legal proceedings against those who are accused of being Christians. Because if you're accused of being a Christian, you're you're not saying Kaiser Hokurios. You're not saying Caesar is Lord. You're you're refusing that, and so you're getting in trouble with the government. Pliny says that he needed to consult the emperor about this issue because a great multitude of every age, class, and sex stood accused of Christianity, denying that Caesar was Lord, saying that Ieso Curios, that Jesus is Lord. At one point in his letter, Pliny relates some of the information he has learned about the Christians when he says this. This is in Pliny's letter to Trajan. It says, they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Boy, how awful these people sound in this grand conspiracy and deception. Anyway, it says here, Pliny's letters, uh, letter helps us to understand what the early Christians believed about Jesus. It reveals the great respect in which they held his teachings. For example, Pliny notes that Christians bound themselves by a, sol a solemn oath not to violate various moral standards that are found in the ethical teachings of Jesus. It doesn't really fit with a conspiracy to enslave someone, really, does it? Also, Pliny's reference to the Christian custom of sharing a common meal likely alludes to the observance of the communion and the, quote, love feast. This interpretation helps explain the Christian claim that the meal was merely food of an ordinary and innocent kind, and not cannibalism. Now, this is, this is an example of early apologetics, or defending the faith against false claims, as they were countering the charge of, practic of practicing ritual cannibalism. This was something that was thought about Christians. They're cannibals. They're eating the flesh and blood of their God. That, of course, that's, well, we're talking about Roman Catholicism. That's that maybe so, but uh, uh, not the early Christians. The Christians of that day humbly repudiated such slanderous attacks on Jesus' teachings. And we have to do the same thing today. Now, the infamous Josephus. Perhaps the most remarkable reference to Jesus 
outside the Bible can be found in the writings of Josephus, a first century Jewish historian. And on two occasions in his uh, Jewish antiquities, his history of the Jews, he mentions Jesus. The second, less revealing reference describes the condemnation of one named James by the Jewish Sanhedrin. This James was, quote, the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, said Joseph, uh, Josephus. F.F. F. Bruce, theologian, apologist, and the, or theologian, Christian theologian, points out how this agrees with Paul's description of James in Galatians 1.19 as the Lord's brother. And histor uh, historian Edwin uh, Yamauchi informs us that, quote, few scholars have questioned that Josephus actually penned this passage. As interesting as, interesting as this uh, brief reference is, there is an even earlier one, which is truly astonishing, and it's called the Testimonium Flavianum. Irrelevant, the relevant portion says this, About this time there lived a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he wrought surprising feats, he was the Christ. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day he appeared, restored to life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared to this day. So the, the objection here is, did Josephus really even write this? Most scholars think the core of this passage originated with Josephus but that it was later alter, uh, altered by a Christian editor, possibly between the 3rd and 4th century. But why do they think it was altered? Josephus was not a Christian, and it's difficult to believe that anyone but a Christian would have made some of these statements. Of course, Josephus was loyal to the... He was a Jew that was uh, loyal to the Roman Empire. For instance, the claim that Jesus was a wise man seems authentic, but the qualifying phrase, quote, if indeed one ought to call him a man, unquote, is suspect. It implies that Jesus was more than human, and it is quite unlikely that Josephus would have said that. It's also difficult to believe he would have, uh, he would have uh, flatly asserted that Jesus was the Christ, especially when he later refers to Jesus as the so-called Christ. Finally, the claim that on the third day Jesus appeared to his disciples was stored to life inasmuch as it affirms Jesus' resurrection is quite unlikely to come from a non-Christian. All right, so there are the objections about what Josephus has to say. But even if we disregard the questionable parts of this passage, we're still left with a good deal of corroborating information about the biblical Jesus. We read that he was a wise man who performed surprising feats. And although he was crucified under Pilate, his followers continued their discipleship and became known as his followers. They became known as Christians. And when we combine these statements with Josephus' later reference to Jesus as the so-called Christ, a rather detailed picture emerges which harmonizes quite well with the biblical record. It increasingly appears that the biblical Jesus and the historical Jesus are one and the same. Now, for much more, if you, I, I've got much more here on Josephus. That, uh, it's just, uh, we don't want this to be four hours long. Maybe we can do it in another video. But if you would like more information... On Josephus and Tacitus, you need to know why, why, why should we consider these reliable sources. See the link in the description where it says, Lacona answers Acharya S. Once again, when we were dealing with Zeitgeist, he, he answers her on this issue too. She made the claim too that you can't use Josephus. You can't use Tacitus. So for more of that, and there's plenty, there's pages that he's written in response to her about this. And finally now, the sixth criterion historians use to determine what is a reliable account of past events is this. No more than a very small percentage of items reported, uh, reported by an ancient author are known to be false. Now, the, you might say, well, what? Some, of, some things can be false? No, what this means is that none are perfect. 
and that the concept of the proof is just a concept found in mathematics and science. It's proof is not something that's found in history, and it's not uh, also it's not found anywhere in anyone's daily life. You don't uh, you don't constantly asking for proof everywhere you go. Now there are only a few historical claims. So what we're asking here is how much of the stuff is is true. There are only a few historical claims in the Gospels that are reasonable candidates for being incorrect. For example, Luke's report of Augustus' uh, census, the different genealogies in Matthew and Luke, and the chronologies uh, in their infancy narratives about Jesus. Three instances where a name in the Old Testament is stated differently in the Gospels, and a few occasions where Mark may have uh, misreported geographical location, may have, may have misreported geographical locations, and of course, the manner in which Judas died in Matthew and Acts. You know, did he hang himself or did he fall off a cliff and his belly explode? Which was it? Uh, but even if we were determined that every one of these and some others were absolutely errors, they are minor matters that change nothing about the core doctrine taught by Jesus and the overall truth claims of Christianity. Even if we go ahead and combine these issues with all the known textual variants, which is where words are slightly different or passages that uh, might not have been included in the earliest manuscript copies, if we combine all of these things, if you can trust anything from history, you can trust the New Testament documents. Looks like we might be getting some buffering. Hey, are we uh, still on the air over there? We good? We on the air? Still live? Okay. It just looked like we had some buffering going on there. Now, uh, to finish up the idea about how can you know anything about history, just sort of re to recap this, historians apply something called the criteria of authenticity to determine whether a document or source is reliable or whether it's unreliable, or a fabrication, or shall we say, a hoax. Now, these criteria are these. Number one, is the item reported by an early source? We heard Ehrman talk about this earlier. Number two, is the item reported by an eyewitness? Number three, is the item reported by an unsympathetic source? And number four, is the item reported by multiple independent sources? That means people who are unknown to one another. And as Ehrman said earlier on, you get this in spades. You've got this in abundance. So when these tried and true criteria of reporting reliable history are applied to the New Testament documents and other reports about the life of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, it is nearly unanimous among historians and related scholars that if we can know anything at all about history, we can be certain of this fact at minimum. This same Jesus of the Bible most certainly lived. To dismiss Jesus as a myth is to cast aside all reason. And to dismiss Jesus as a myth is to show a personal lack for the love of truth. So, if you're interested in going further in the issue of why Josephus and Tacitus, once again, are accepted as, author as authoritative by a majority of modern scholars, I've provided a link in the description here. There are many links in the description, actually, but there's one here specifically for this. It's Michael Lacona's rebuttal of Acharya S. And by extension, uh, a, a ref a refutation of the false claims of the Zeitgeist movie and, uh, movement. How can we know anything about history? So we've dealt with most of these things. I, I think that if we're going to deal with, did Paul invent Christianity? I think we can go ahead and deal with that since we're, since we're here with it right now. Because that's one of the claims of the mythicist movement is that Paul has created. He has made it up. Somebody lied. There was no biblical Jesus. The Bible says there was. Somebody lied. So to me, I want to know who lied, when, and why. Those are the questions that I'm interested in.
Okay, so who lied, when, and why? Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna make that case, you're gonna have to find someone that reports someone lying, right? And we don't get any mythicist arguments for almost one thousand for almost two thousand years. No one says a word. No one offers any objection to the validity of New Testament documents. Yeah, we'll we'll have to do whether or not Paul invented Christianity. In other words, did Paul change Jesus' teachings and invent Christianity? We'll deal with that in a different, in a different uh, show, and I'll deal more specifically with some problems of David Scribina's uh, uh, arguments. So before we get out of here now, though, let's look at this. Let me do this little short presentation right quick. Why is it that we're so sure that the New Testament documents are historical? And if they are historical, then Jesus Christ lived. Jesus of Nazareth was a man who lived. And if we can show that to be the, the case, then all of this others, we don't need to listen to any other of the, of the, the arguments made because their whole argument centers around Jesus is a myth. So we show him not to be a myth. Their argument falls apart. Their movement falls apart. And how do we do that? Well, let's look at history. Let's finish it up. We have some examples here for you. Let's see here. Make this a little bigger. Okay. I think I've, I've got my, yeah, here we go. Okay. If the critics want to disregard New Testament, then you have to uh, also, also disregard other ancient writings by the likes of Plato, Aristotle, and Homer. And some of you out there may do that. Some of you out there may feel that you can't trust anything. That's not a healthy perspective. There are ways to know truth. Uh, but this is because the New Testament documents are better preserved and more numerous than any other ancient writings. Because they are so numerous, they can be cross-checked for accuracy. This is called textual criticism. And they are very consistent. There are presently more than 5,800 Greek manuscripts. This number is rising all the time because more uh, fragments are being found. But there are more than... 5,800 Greek manuscripts in existence today. Folks, when someone tells you that you can't trust the Bible because it's been translated through all these languages, that's bunk. Bibles come to you translated from the original language, which was, in this case, Koine Greek, if we're talking about the New Testament. Now, there are, there are, there are Bible translations that have been translated a couple times, maybe from the Greek into, into Latin, and then from Latin into English, but... You know, your, your modern translations are going to give you a nice, clear <clears throat> uh, translation straight from the original language. Anyway, right now we have more than uh, almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts in existence today for the New Testament. What does that mean? That's manuscript copies. That's scribes would copy the originals for people who ordered them or just for posterity. There are many reasons they would do that. If we were to compare the number of New Testament manuscripts to other ancient writings, we find that the New Testament manuscripts far outweigh the others in quantity. There are thousands more New, uh, New Testament Greek manuscripts than any other ancient writing. And the internal consistency of the New Testament documents, here you go, is about 99.5% textually pure. That is an amazing accuracy that is not found in any other document from history. Additionally, there are over 19, now at this point, over 20,000 copies, manuscript copies that uh, uh, included from Greek and the other languages, like Syriac, Latin, Coptic, Aramaic. Therefore, the total supporting New Testament manuscript base, these manuscript copies, is over 24,000 Almost all biblical scholars agree that the New Testament documents were written all of them written before the close of the first century. If Jesus was crucified in A.D. 30, 
then that means the entire New Testament was completed within one lifetime, within one generation. This is important because it means there were plenty of people around when the New Testament documents were written. Plenty of people who could, who could have contested the writings. People who could have piped up and said, hey, it's a myth, don't believe it. We don't see that. In other words, those who wrote, wrote the documents knew that if they were inaccurate, plenty of people were going to notice it and point it out. because That's what they did. But we have absolutely no ancient documents contemporary to the first century that contest the New Testament text. Now, another important aspect of this discussion is the fact that we have a fragment of the Gospel of John that dates back to around 29 years from the original writing. This is known as the John Ryland's papyri. I wonder if I can get a... I think we can get a, get you a picture of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't look like much. But this is, this is from about 29 years. Now, people would say, oh, that's so far removed, isn't it? People say that. Well, is, is, is that a good argument, though? The point is, this is extremely close to the original writing date. This is simply unheard of in any other document from ancient history. And it demonstrates that the Gospel of John is a first century document. And that, that flies in the face of the claims made by Scribina and Fitzgerald and uh, uh, Earl Doherty. Compare these time spans with the next closest, which is Homer's Iliad. There we go. Homer's Iliad, which is, uh, let's see where we got Homer here. There it is. Homer's Iliad is the closest thing to the New Testament, and it is miles apart. You can see here uh, Homer's Iliad, the date it was written. It was written in around 900 B.C. The earliest manuscript copy available for Homer's Iliad is from 400 B.C., and that is 500 years. 500 years separating the original from the first available manuscript copy that's available right now. And there are 643 manuscript copies of this thing available. And the textual purity of all of those copies is about 95%. That's as close as anything comes. You can see otherwise here. You can see how some of these other uh, histories go. Herodotus. Herodotus is... Uh, uh, writings were around uh, 480 to 425 B.C. The earliest manuscript copy available for this is uh, 900. That is 1,300 years, and there are only eight copies available. Nobody questions it. Maybe they do, but not like they question the New Testament. Even the writings of Tacitus or Aristotle, 1,000 years and 1,400 years, respectively, between the time when they were written and the earliest manuscript, earliest dated manuscript copy that's available for anyone to, to look at today. And there's only 10 or 20 of them available. How does the New Testament compare? Well, there you go. There's the evidence. If, if you don't like this evidence, well, that's okay. You don't like it, but there it is. For the New Testament, Documents written at some time between, let's just be conservative and say between 50 and 100 A.D. within the same generation of Jesus' death is res uh, and resurrection. The earliest manuscript copies completed that we have are from the 2nd century A.D. That's in the, like a 130 A.D. That's less than 100 years. I've just shown you some examples where it's even, where you even have fragments that are within the same generation. And there are, at this point, nearly 6,000 manuscript copies available. And look at this number right here. How? This is, this, is the, this is how you're able to know whether or not these copies would be faithful to the originals. 
And what this number represents, 99.5%, that means that of all of these manuscript copies, let's just talk about the ones in Greek right now, which is the language they were written in. Of all of these, nearly 6,000 copies, that as you look at these writings from one collection to the next, they say the same thing at a rate of 99.5%. And, and that's, what, that's, that's what we mean by a textual variant. Is A word is spelled differently. Something's out of place. Or perhaps even, you'll have examples uh, like uh, where, where a passage ends up in, in a Bible that uh, maybe wasn't there in some of the earlier ones. That counts as a, as a variant as well. These documents are 99.5% textually pure. That means they say the same thing. If the critics of the Bible dismiss the New Testament as reliable, then you also have to dismiss the reliability of the writings of Plato, Aristotle, Caesar, Homer, and anyone else from the time. On the other hand, if the critics acknowledge the historicity and writings of those other individuals, then they must also retain the historicity and writings of the New Testament authors. After all, the evidence, the evidence, just what we're looking at here, the evidence for the New Testament's reliability is far, far greater than the others. So that said, folks, the Christian has substantially by far superior criteria for affirming our core documents, the New Testament documents, than anyone does for any other ancient writing. So what does this mean? This means that it is good evidence on which to base the trust, to base trust in the reliability of the New Testament. It is good evidence good evidence and plenty of it to show us that Jesus Christ lived was real was there as Bart Ehrman said in short if there is any conspiracy here at all it is on the part of modern authors who make up stories about the ancient Christians and what they believed about Jesus Likewise, if there's any conspiracy here, I'd say it lands squarely on the shoulders of the Jesus mythicists who offer their audiences claims without evidence or offer their audiences claims that ignore this evidence that we've looked at here tonight. And this is not even close to all of it. There's so much here. On this desk, just, just, we don't have time to get to. I think we're going to have to do another one of these probably next week uh, because I don't want to leave anything out because we haven't even dealt with the claim that Scribina is going to make here and Adam's going to support that Paul just created Christianity. They'll say that Paul never knew Jesus. Well, we, we, he, he doesn't report it, but Paul's a Pharisee in first century in the first century in the area, he almost certainly had, had occasion to be in the same area with Jesus, probably saw him, maybe even met him. It's not out of the realm of possibility because uh, Paul was a, he was a high-ranking Pharisee. Uh, but they're, what they're going to tell you is that he never stopped being a Pharisee, that he was leading the deception, the deception that is Christianity. Uh, my question to Adam and the mythicist crowd is, if Christianity is a deception to ensnare the Gentiles, please explain to me how I'm ensnared. Please explain to me how I am enslaved. Please help me to, I'm, sincerely, please help me to understand how it is that I've been hoodwinked. How have I been duped and tricked? All right, my friends, that's about enough, don't you think, for one day? I want to say uh, thank these. thanks to, uh, there's Kelly Henson, thanks for hanging around. Team Retard is in the house, it's good to see you out there. Leslie Mars, uh, Christopher Cunningham, there's Brian Brown, what's up? Uh, 
I wonder, I, I think the, uh, someone said the other day that the super chat feature wasn't working. I checked it out. It was, it got turned off when the channel got terminated the other day. Something weird happened today as well. The, uh, Facebook, the Facebook page disappeared from Facebook for a little while. Who knows? Who knows what that's about? Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe there's some people out there flagging the channel and flagging our social media. Who knows? Because it's weird when your channel disappears, is terminated on YouTube for an hour, and then it comes back, and then your Facebook page is taken down for a little while, and then it comes back. That that has the smell of of uh, people with uh, bad intentions flagging you and then forcing the platform to to take your page down and then double check and make sure whether or not you're doing whatever they said you were doing. Who knows, man? Team Retard says the Super Chat is available, so I think that it is. It's there and available. Uh, there's links in the description if you want to help us out. Uh, we'll um, appreciate that very much. We need your help more than ever because, as you can see, the views on these, these videos, they're just it's this stuff is not being promoted by the platform at all. And uh, it's uh, it's uh, strange how that uh, sometimes when we talk about these issues and we just we, we we forego what feels right and we stick to what is what can be shown to be true and deal with the truth. Sometimes you lose viewers. Sometimes you lose supporters, and uh, that's happened. That's happened around here, but that's okay. We're gonna do what we do. We're gonna stick to it. And um, we just appreciate your support. Your prayers are what we need more than anything. And I hope that this video will land on the right people in the right way. I haven't meant this in any way to be derogatory toward any individuals. Just their claims. Just their claims. That's all I'm interested in, in refuting or, or taking on. I don't know these people personally. But uh, thank you there, Lazy Mars, for that super sticker. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And so while we're still available here on YouTube, we hope you'll join us again. Who knows how long it's going to last. I don't know. It uh, seems like our time on YouTube here is, is running out, maybe even on Facebook too. So we're, uh, we're working hard to build, a, uh, build something for you to come find us and where we can all be together elsewhere. We'll be here too as long as they let us just not in our full form. All right, my friends. Uh, we'll see you again here next time. I don't even know what today is. This is Thursday, I think. Next time for uh, uh, Armor of Truth Live, perhaps on uh, Sunday afternoon. We'll see you here again. If not before then, God bless you, my friends. We'll see you next time. Armor of Truth. In the age of technocracy, scientism, and pop atheism, faith is resistance. Nietzsche, of course, announced the death of God and called for the birth of the Übermensch. The Superman who would take humanity to new heights and to create a new world order. Find us at the Brad from Carolina YouTube channel and log on armoroftruth.net. Armor of Truth, live. Faith is resistance.